Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, and um, as introduced by uh, Patrick, my name is Andrew. And um, I think for very good reason, um, he didn't go into saying my surname. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, normally when I go to court, and um, I normally get a lot of apologies from the judges, or when I go somewhere, they'll say, there's some names that we'll find difficult uh, pronouncing, and I just, I, can you just forgive us in advance, and then I know it will be my surname. So my surname is uh, Nyamayaro, and I always uh, go up saying N for November, Y for Yoyo, A for Alpha, <laughs> and it's a very long surname anyway. By the time I get to the O, the person is already wishing to ask the next question. And uh, the other thing is that um, when we get uh, the recording of the court uh, decisions, my surname always get a variety of spellings. So <laughs> my surname has been spelled so many times I can't remember. Uh, so um, it, I am the principal of Tanlo Solicitors and uh, a firm that I founded in uh, October 2016, so this October is our fifth anniversary. Uh, we, we are based in Coventry um, City Centre uh, near the firms um, like uh, Warden Rider and Austin Ellis, that's a particular section, of that, that's where we are. And I'm also the current uh, president of the Warwickshire Law Society and um, Robert being um, my vice president and uh, Chelsea being uh, the president of the uh, Young Lawyers Division. So being um, um, October, the Black History Month, um, it is, um, I, I appreciate being invited to come today and um, I'm just sorry for the mix up of the time. In my head, I thought it's one o'clock, uh, but it was, uh, it was 12 o'clock. Um, next time when inviting African, uh, give them an hour ahead to come. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to come on time, but I, I, I apologize to everyone for, for, for that mix up. So I come uh, from Zimbabwe. I was born in Zimbabwe. I was born in a town which is about 20 kilometers from Harare, which is uh, the capital city. And uh, my parents were, were relatively well to do, not very rich, but not very poor. But um, my father worked in a warehouse and my mother was uh, unemployed, but my mother had um, some business charisma. She always did all sort of businesses uh, at the time, which um, was quite good for us. And um, um, due to that, I was able to go to school. Uh, most people were finding it difficult to go to school. So uh, after doing my school, I went to University of Zimbabwe, which, is, which at the time, was the only university available. It was a, a, a lot of competition to enter to, into university because that was the only university in the country. And I'm not, look, I'm not talking about a long time ago, I'm just talking um, 1996, that was the only university that was offering law. There was another university in Blawai, but it wasn't offering law, so that was the only law school. And I finished law school in um, year 2000. I practiced in Zimbabwe from uh, year 2000 to year 2002. Um, when I was in Zimbabwe, it was um, because law in Zimbabwe, while least it's um, the, almost the same because the Zimbabweans, we were colonized by the British um, in, in 1980. So I would say 80% of our law is British law, but it's mixed with um, German law or what is called the, the Dutch law. So we've got the Roman Dutch law in Zimbabwe. Um, so, um, and uh, because there's not so much work to do rather than here in the UK, um, the firm would do whatever comes through the door. So any client that comes through the door, you will make sure that that client will not leave until you've signed them up. So it was, it was a general practice. So you will be the criminal lawyer, you'll be the civil lawyer, you'll be, you'll be doing all sorts of things. So that's the kind of uh, practice that I was uh, in in Zimbabwe. Um, and during that time, uh, year 2002, as some of you might recall, there was some political and economic problems in, in Zimbabwe, and there was a lot of moving of people from Zimbabwe going abroad into the diaspora. 
my wife, then my girlfriend, um, in the year 2001, came to, uh, to the UK. And um, some of you might remember in history, there used to be a footballer called Peter Ndlov. Uh, and he was from Zimbabwe and was playing in Coventry. Uh, so because of Peter, Coventry was very popular. So, <laughs> so one of the choices that my wife had to put on the university was Coventry. Because we know Coventry for Peter, he was played for Coventry and for Sheffield. So she got the place at Coventry University and um, she started nursing at Coventry University. I joined her here in the UK in the year 2002. Uh, so when I came, I was already a, a lawyer. I was already practicing. I had some years of practice. So that's me thinking that if I go to the UK, I'm going to just uh, go and apply and get a job easily as I'm a lawyer. Uh, that was a shock for, for my life. <laughs> because when I came in year 2002, um, I had uh, got my certificate of good standing from the Zimbabwe Law Society and I had uh, started the process of uh, doing the qualified lawyers transfer tests, uh, which were there at the time. And um, I got uh, those days, we still had the big yellow pages. So I went into the section of the yellow pages and I sent. Uh, my CV to every law firm in Coventry that I could see. Um, I only got three responses of re with regrets and uh, no one else responded. Then I just knew that the, the game was hard. Um, I was thinking I would go in straight away, but I couldn't go in straight away um, because obviously maybe I didn't have the experience to having worked in the United Kingdom and also what I realized retrospectively was that the way I was doing my CV was wrong. <laughs> Back home, when you've got a CV, you need to make it a, as large as possible to try to prove each and everything that you've done. Six, seven, eight pages of a CV. And then in this country, if you send a CV to Robert, which is more than two pages, you might not have time to, to read <laughs> everything else. So uh, because of that, I could not get into the legal sector for a while, for about six or seven years. So uh, for us to survive, my wife was a student and then we had children and um, she was working part time as well as a, as a carer. And then I had to work as a carer myself. I had to do uh, supported living, work in a warehouse to raise money for, for me to come back to practice because the exams at the time uh, with the practice, I think it was coming to almost 5,000 and uh, having left Zimbabwe with um, almost a million of Zimbabwean dollars, which, which was equivalent to almost 100 pounds. <laughs> we didn't have the money, so we had to work and uh, did do the exams. I did the exams, passed some and uh, failed some of the exams. And uh, in 2008, I started to volunteer um, I, I, I volunteered in a, in a law firm and I also um, did a bit of work uh, briefly with uh, the Citizens Advisory Bureau and then I also then, um, and I think it was 2009, I joined the magistrates as a volunteer. Um, so I was sitting on the bench for about a year in Coventry and um, then I then passed my exams in, that was in year 2011, I think I passed my QLTS. But one of the conditions was that for me to be uh, admitted as a solicitor, I needed to have experience in, uh, in England and Wales. So um, at that stage, I having had not so much experience, no firm was willing to employ me. Um, I would put it to experience. I would also want to think it could it be, have been something to do with my ethnicity or my race, uh, hence this talk today. But I couldn't um, get so much until um, I got a firm in Birmingham that uh, employed me um, and I got my 12 months experience which was required. Um, and then they got me as a caseworker, part of it, and part of it was as a, as a volunteer. And uh, June 2012, I was admitted um, as a solicitor um, um, in London at, at the Law Society. I think 
um, on that court that was admitted that day, I was the, the most happiest guy there. Um, I, I remember, I don't know if they recorded the video, I think I was waving from the other end to the end until I got to where the president was, the way they were keeping us, because it was quite an achievement for me to, to become a solicitor in the United Kingdom. Um, being a solicitor in the United Kingdom has showed me a lot of things, and um, it is a closed, in my view, a closed uh, profession. Um, if you are an outsider, it's quite difficult to break through. It could be you're an outsider because of um, your race, maybe, or maybe someone once told me that when I was doing applications, they see, asked me, where do you live? I told the person where I live. Then he told me, that's the wrong postcode. You need to be putting the right postcode. So I don't know if it's something to do with the postcode as well, or it's something to, to do, but um, I had difficulties getting into the, into the legal sector. And once I got into the legal sector, it, I, it was lonely. There's so many lawyers and so many solicitors and everyone else, but it felt so, so lonely because um, um, I wasn't known and um, maybe I'm still not known by a lot of people in the profession or maybe that applies to, to everyone else. But my, my experience is people said tests tend to to stick together with people whom they know or maybe people whom they identify, the whom they identify with. Um, so I'm really grateful for this opportunity today to speak about this because um, my communication with other solicitors who are from, um, who are black or maybe from other ethnicities is that it is difficult to become a solicitor and once you become a solicitor, um, I think the, there was a survey that was done so recently. Um, there is, you, you are always having it in your mind that um, if I get a decision from whoever is the decision maker or a, a, an adjudicator, was this decision based on the fairness of the case or it was other considerations of of what I've done. So I always try to do what I do um, times two what I think someone else can do because I, 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 I'm not so sure of why the reasons could be. And um, the, the survey that was done for the SRA and the, S, uh, uh, the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, the SD, the STD, uh, the SD, what is Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal, was that there was um, in a higher number of ethnic people being uh, prosecuted um, in the tribunal and being found guilty of uh, whatever um, offenses that uh, they were being um, alleged to, to have committed. So it's always in the background of my mind, it's always in the background of anyone who is um, um, African or Afro-Caribbean uh, as to um, what exactly is happening and um, whether or not the next step you will see someone coming from the law society to knock on your door or the SRA to say you are coming to intervene into your firm because of uh, ABC uh, which might be linked to uh, the ethnicity or to, to, to being black. But um, mm, since I have been practicing, I think I've been trying to make inroads um, I've been trying to get networking with other solicitors and I've been trying to, um, to build a brand of the firm that I think maybe in future might also be recognized. Um, you know, even the issue also maybe comes not only from colleagues or from the regulators, um, it might be also from, so from, from clients. Sometimes uh, when you are dealing with clients, you're also very conscious uh, that some clients might not want to instruct you because simply because you're black or simply because on the phone, when they hear a heavy accent, uh, they will say, um, okay, we are going to come back again. And then they, <laughs> they, 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 will, they, they will never come back again. Um, so some of the points that, I've, um, that I've, I've written here is that the challenges in my journey have been as follows. 
um, I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, although there is a black majority rule in Zimbabwe, the opportunities were not available to everyone else. Uh, Zimbabwe is a country where there is a lot of nepotism, a lot of corruption, um, and a, a, a lot of um, who do you know, not what you know. So um, to get opportunities there was very difficult as well. And like I said, to just enter into the, you know, into the university, the, there was only one law school, so it was quite a difficult um, thing to do, but uh, hope, I, I did make it through. There is black on black oppression. So while we think of um, Black History Month, when we speak of Black History Month, people just think of oppression of the black people, or they, they think of inequality of, of black people, but um, from um, um, white people or from other ethnicities, but even among us today, the, the, the black people, there is inequality that exists. Um, uh, if you speak of Zimbabwe at the moment, uh, for example, uh, the LGBTQ community is oppressed, and there's a lot of culture, cultural issues which are there. So in the culture, um, we are patriarchal, so ladies are more like after men uh, in the hierarchy. Um, and um, there's, a, there's also religion, um, there's the issues of religion whereby um, the religion is, um, what can I say about the religion is it's quite strict religion. When you get Christians, uh, they'll be very charismatic, uh, Pentecostal, uh, who have got very stringent conditions on the members or on women or on children. Um, so that has been some of the difficulties that I've, I've faced in Zimbabwe. And then when it comes to the QLTS, uh, which was the transfer test, um, I think I, I believe that that, was, that has been deliberately made very difficult, either in itself or maybe in its assessment for, to exclude foreign lawyers to enter into a closed market uh, because the pass rate is very, is, is very low when it comes to the QLTS. Um, I, I think it's some of the things that has been considered um, by um, the Law Society, the SRA and um, the legal board education board when they've introduced the SQE. I know that the SQE has not been a cup of tea for everyone else because um, what it means is that the traditional training route of the training contract and the LPC is now gone. But uh, the whole point of the SQE was that it has to give equal opportunities to, to everyone. Because some people could not get training contracts because they don't have the right connections to get into the right firms and get um, the, the, right, um, the right practice areas. Um, when it comes to practice areas, I think as well that has been a challenge. Um, when I started my firm, um, by default, I had to start with immigration. <laughs> The reason why I had to start with immigration is because I, I, I felt I'm acceptable there and I, I felt that I could get clients uh, and um, the, the, firm, the, the firms that I'd worked with it also had immigration. So uh, because I'm a foreigner, if I get someone from uh, whether from Africa, India, Pakistan or whichever country that they're coming from, uh, then they could um, at least accept. So my default area was I was um, immigration. And another reason why the default area was uh, immigration was that it's considered to be a low risk area. So in terms of uh, public indemnity insurance, it's, it's cheap. Uh, it's, it's, it's not so expensive when it comes to, uh, say, areas like convincing, uh, where, which are considered as high risk. But um, if you're a small firm, then uh, you cannot afford to then you have a high public indemnity insurance. So while least you can see that, oh, that is a nice piece of cake, but you cannot eat it because of such complications. So um, those are the, some of the things that, um, the, the, that I have faced. So um, <clears throat> when it comes to, to networking, and that, this is the reason why I joined the law societies that, um, and we've been working very hard with, with, with Robert to try to establish a network of solicitors. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we have to be meeting all the time or to, but at least to, 
to have someone to sound um, your views or um, to, to your to just have someone whom you can talk to or relate to. Um, I don't know if people go for golf or they go for uh, table tennis or whatever they do. And um, we had one meet and greet event um, here in this off downstairs. Um, and it was a very good event that was attended by so by three or four, maybe five firms that came around here and everyone enjoyed it. But um, as a single, male black solo practitioner in a firm. It's quite lonely sometimes because you've got no one which, who is there to, to help you uh, with uh, running the firm. You have to put on all the heads. Uh, in my case, uh, we, you are the money laundering officer and you are the cop and you are the coffer and uh, you've got, uh, uh, you're handling all the complaints and the complaints that you can handle, then you have to outsource to a compliance company and, and, and so forth. So um, the reason why I also had to start my own firm at the time, while I was just, I also wanted to be, um, um, to, to have my own business, was that at the, at the firm that, was, that I was working, I had almost reached a ceiling and I couldn't see myself going beyond where I was in terms of promotion or progression. Um, so I had to, to start my own firm. So opportunities for ethnic firms uh, in certain areas of law are limited. Hence, uh, we do such area law uh, with some areas such as um, immigration. And then with me, I started with the immigration. And then uh, we added in uh, family and um, we, we now added in uh, employment, but our turnover is not so high with things that we are trying to work on so that we can get a great turnover. Um, when, it comes, when it comes to recruitment, um, one thing that I also can comment on as a, as a principle of a firm is that um, not so many people with due respect are are eager to work through for or are willing to work for a firm that is owned by uh, black people I would want to submit. Um, I've um, recruited people who maybe simply just uh, when they, when they, I think they've been successful in my interview, they've turned me down. Or if they've come, it's just, it just has been a stepping stone for them to move into the city or to move elsewhere and, and, and then stop. But um, it also gives me a chance to introspect uh, whether I'm doing things right or maybe I've got um, the wrong perceptions of what is happening. So maybe um, when it comes to, to recruitment, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of um, um, teaching that needs to be done that um, if it's a firm, it has got no color, it's a firm, it's a law firm, solicitors, we, we are regulated and bound by a certain uh, conduct. Um, um, and we, are, we have got uh, laws and bylaws that we abide by. Uh, the other challenges that I faced myself um, coming from uh, where I came from and because of um, not being British with that, um, I had to make various visa applications for myself and my family. And um, some people can't afford the visa fees. They are very expensive. Um, if I can say for now, if someone is to make a, a visa application for a family of four, a mother and a father and two children, you are looking at um, a minimum of 8,500 for a visa of two and a half years. And that's quite a lot of money uh, for someone um, in, in, in my community, you'll find that uh, most of the people do low paying jobs. So they work as in the warehouse, they work in the uh, as support workers, as carers, and um, some are now professional. But if you are earning um, 13,000 a year and uh, you've got 
for people to make a visa application for. So, and uh, the, one of the part parties or partners um, in the marriage can't do full-time work because there's children. So maybe household income is um, 20,000. It's very difficult to do the visa applications. You will then see some people now becoming illegal in the country. They can't afford the visas, so they have to stay without their visas. And then if, uh, if the Home Office knows, then they risk being detained and uh, deported. So the visa issue is always um, um, something that is always scaring people, particularly in the um, black community, um, for people that have come from outside uh, the country. And um, because um, it's either they don't meet the requirements for the visa or the visa itself is quite expensive. Black History Month is not always a time of mourning. Um, it's, it's a time also of celebrating. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that have been done um, that have gone in a, in a very good, positive way um, I'd like to, to submit. Um, for me, getting into the profession, although it was very difficult, has been a very good thing for me because I'm now in, in the profession and I can now also um, represent uh, people from ethnic um, backgrounds. I've got clients from different uh, backgrounds. I've got Asian, African, Caribbean, American. I would have thought that an American would want to claim asylum. I've had uh, two or three Americans trying to claim asylum in the UK. Obviously, they don't have grounds. <laughs> but um, I've worked with, with um, a, a lot of people. Um, in, in terms of the profession, um, I've indicated the survey that was done, and um, I think there is some corrective action or positive action that is being done uh, by the SRA and uh, the Solicitor's Disciplinary uh, Tribunal. Um, in, also further to, to that, um, when it comes to opportunities, um, I've also noticed that um, there is, if, especially if you are from an ethnic background, uh, if you want to become a judge, for example, there's now certain quotas that are there, so you can go and do certain courses uh, to fast track you or to fast track um, someone to become a judge or at least to be given opportunity or even to, 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 be, to become a solicitor. So I think in terms of our profession, we are going in the right direction. Um, and there is also um, the fact that in, instead of just becoming a solicitor through the traditional uh, route, uh, which was a training contract, LPC, and then you become a solicitor. There's now other ways which open up avenues for other um, ethnicities. Um, now you can become a solicitor by becoming an apprentice. Um, I think it's level seven that you need to do to become a solicitor. You can start from level four, I think. And you can use other um, avenues such as becoming um, you can become a licensed conveyancer or you can become Silex. You can go through the Silex route or you can go through, um, become accredited as a person who is doing a specialist area of law, accredited as a uh, immigration advisor or as a family advisor and so forth. I think doing that is also giving opportunities to, to people and also um, Salaries were also an issue, or is an issue as well. I think that relates to um, the male Caucasian might be earning more compared to a female Caucasian and compared to a black person or to an Asian person. But I think um, the salary issue is also being redressed uh, when it comes to, to, to the law. So I think that is my brief, it was brief. Uh, presentation and if maybe if there's any questions I can take in any questions um, uh, from my experience um, from from Zimbabwe up to the United Kingdom okay th thank you so much for your question um, I'm not so sure of the process that you use uh, at the moment in, in a recruitment or um, maybe where you advertise. 
um, but may maybe you advertise online now uh, where anyone else can see the adverts. Um, so maybe just making sure that uh, where the advertisement is put is accessible to, to most people, uh, whether it's online or in a local newspaper um, or through the universities, but some universities can also take candidates. And also, um, whether when you shortlist, is it a, a, a blind shortlisting or it's not a blind shortlisting because um, some people might have, um, if they've got a stigma against certain people and they see Andrew Nia Mayaro or something like that, then they might not shortlist that person. But again, that depends with the size of the film. With, your, with a film like this size, maybe you might do a blind shortlisting of uh, the candidates. Um, and maybe it, when it comes to doing interviews, uh, depending on, on the size of your HR, maybe having a panel so that it's not um, the decision of a single person to either recruit or not recruit that person. Um, if there's diversity in the firm as well, if there's diversity in the department, maybe um, it can also consider that um, it's not only for, for, for the racially, maybe it could be uh, for other reasons where you need to have diversity um, because people are different in terms of race, sexuality, religion, and all those things. And so maybe having a panel might also help. You got me on the spot, but I think I answered well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I love law. I've, um, that's why when, even when I was in Zimbabwe, I decided to, to do law because I like uh, people to have their rights and I like to advocate. Uh, I'm missing going to court these days because of paperwork um, as a partner. But if I was to do it again, I think I would. Um, I would do it again, um, but maybe do it better um, the ways that I did it at the time because I, I think coming in without, no, without someone guiding me, without a mentor, without someone giving me information, whatever I knew was just through my research or what I thought was right at the time. So if, if I was to do it again, I would maybe um, do it better, approach maybe the law society, the local law society approach uh, people individually. I did send CVs, but you know, a CV just goes into the intro, and once the intro, someone will forget about it. Okay, so w w with the local law society, um, w I became a member in 2016. Um, I think with our law society, it is um, it's not functional as much as it should be. Uh, we, 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 we closed our office. We don't have an office at the moment. We, um, our administrator works part-time from a house. Um, and my office is, um, shares the same entrance with the building that is rented by the Law Society. So when people come there looking for the Law Society, they can't find any, anyone. And sometimes they knock on my door. Fortunately, at the moment, I'm the president, so I can entertain them. <laughs> <laughs> but before, I'll just give them the number. Um, so because of that, we are not so much functional, and um, we don't have enough um, members in the committee, and I can uh, encourage all of you, if you can, to join us and become committee members in whatever uh, capacity you can. So there's, there's not even enough boys to be a boys club. <laughs> 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 so, um, but um, if, if there's a boys club elsewhere, I would want to, to, or a solicitors club, it's something that I'm looking forward to. No, not, I think maybe, uh, w w what I just end up thinking is maybe people think that if you become their friend and then another firm, they, you're trying to steal business from them or you want to get still their ideas or so, they just would want to keep away from you or you become competition to them or something like that. But I think as colleagues and, and in the business, there's lots of work that can be done. Now We won't finish all the work. Instead of competing, we can complement each other in whatever we, we do. Because even in the areas that we do, we can't, I can't do the law as I did it in Zimbabwe, where I could say if someone is coming for murder, I would present them. If someone is coming for, uh, kidnapping I would, do for, I would do for them. If someone is coming for uh, employment matters, I would do everything and anything. But here, 
because the law is most um, detailed, you can just do a few areas. So the Warwickshire Law Society at the moment, it needs a lot of reform, and it needs to, to modernize. I believe strongly that the, the Law Society needs to, to modernize. Um, if you look at our, um, uh, for example, our LinkedIn page, it's even incomplete as I speak. It's, it doesn't have all the information. And, uh, we, we, and yet we have got the junior lawyers and people who, um, who are always uh, on the net, on their mobile phone. And you know, if we just want people to get in touch with us through a, mob, a landline, that is a bit now outdated. So I think we need to revamp our, our law society. That's why it's not even known by uh, the lawyers themselves and by members of, of the public. Um, I've also served, um, I think, a year and a half in the National Law Society. I was uh, the representative of the Warwickshire uh, constituency. Um, and, and, and so in the, I didn't get an opportunity to do face-to-face -face meetings in the National Law Society. We did Zoom meetings, so we didn't have uh, the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, so uh, uh, apart from the team's meetings that we did, I don't really know much about the National Law Society. Um, for the Black History Month, if anything is a takeaway, is that um, everyone is equal. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, it doesn't matter your race, uh, your sexuality, your nationality, uh, your religion. Everyone is equal, and we should give each other um, opportunities without um, any favors. Um, if someone has got uh, the competence to do something, then on merit rather than uh, on, on color or sexuality or any other um, things that um, are not fair on everyone else. So we should uh, consider that everyone is equal before God and the law. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so, well, you, you know what? Um, my son is actually enrolled at the University of Birmingham to study law. <laughs> so it's his first year in, 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 in uh, university because I, I dropped him September on the 15th. I dropped him at, uh, and when we talk, he's always talking about the law. So, yeah, I would, uh, I've influenced my son, maybe. <laughs> so he's studying. Do you think people face similar or different barriers to, to you? Or, or do you feel that his, his progress, his path, will be a lot easier? I think... Exactly. I think for him, um, it might be a bit better than myself. First of all, he's got a British accent. <laughs> So uh, if he's on the phone, people will not uh, say, OK, I'll call you back, and then never call back again. Um, and um, because he was born in this country and has grown in this country, um, he has established uh, his own network of friends um, that are British as well, and um, with his friends and their families, um, and uh, with the school that he has gone to, he has met also very good people there. Uh, so I think he's better placed than myself. Um, but um, you know, being Black History Month, I, I've always told him that um, while you are British, you always have to the society will remind you that you are black. Uh, so the society will remind you that you are black. So you have to to know that you are black, um, and you have to work very hard. Uh, you might not get things on a silver platter. You have to work times two for you to be successful. You have to work very hard. So I've tried to instill that uh, principle in him. Uh, but I, I think he would have better opportunities. Whether or not he will join me in the firm, that's my wish. But <laughs> uh, he might not join me. Or if he does, then that's fine. <laughs>